Oh, glad you've joined me today here today. This is the fifth in the series as uh, we explore the Psalms of Ascent called Pilgrim Psalms. And this one in particular is about service, about opening our eyes to the Lord from Psalm 123. To you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maidservant to the hand of her mistress, to our eyes look to the Lord our God till he has mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us, for we have had more than enough of contempt. Our soul has had more than enough of the scorn of those who are at ease, of the contempt of the proud. Boy, isn't that an honest psalm. It's uh, truth and advertising, I guess. But uh, just to say about these psalms, psalms have a very particular aspect to them. It's not like it's a history. It's not like it's specifically didactic with a point by point. It's more like seeing a photo of something. Now, I'm a lover of history and particularly I like certain phases of history and certain phases of sports history. And I like reading about the Green Bay Packers of the 1960s. Many of you who know about them know that there was one play in particular that was often run by the Packers and that was the Lombardi sweep where the halfback if it was going one way or the fullback if it was going the other way would follow the pulling guards all the way around. Now you can look at that in the diagram with all the X's and O's as they said or you can look at the photo of that of the Lombardi sweep likely you'll see a number five for Paul Horning and number 15 for Bart Starr number 63 for Jerry Kramer. But just to say that that is what the Psalms are like. The Psalm is like the picture. They're not meant to be a rule book. They're not meant to be in that way, but they're meant to be more of a photograph of, of uh, a photograph of, of you think that how things are. And it's more a photograph of how, you might say a snapshot of what's happening emotionally in the Psalmist at that particular point. And this psalm in particular, and many of the psalms, are meant for those who fear that they have been treated contemptuously. It's a place for us to pour out our heart. And this begins by giving us the idea, Psalm 123, of who is really in charge. Now, Jesus presents himself as the servant. If you want to be the greatest, be the servant. So does that mean that we can order Jesus around? Well, God forbid, it doesn't work quite that way because he is the servant to us and it demonstrates how we should also be the servant too. Now, many years ago, I remember as I was riding a bus up into North Minneapolis where I lived for a time with some family, I remember seeing a sign on one of the churches as I went up Penn Avenue on the bus and the sign said this, it says, faith looks up, hope looks ahead. Love looks around. Faith looks up. Hope looks ahead. Love looks around. And I think that is just such an apt description of, of, of the direction of, of our lives. We look up in faith. We look forward in hope. And we look around in love. And just to say about this is it affirms who God really is who's really in charge, do we really believe that God is who he says he is? If he is God, wouldn't it be most natural to believe that he would know best what we really needed? If he was God, if he was all omniscient and all powerful, omniscient and all powerful? Now to say it another way, to say it this way, would we rather have a God that we could figure out 
like a like a puzzle that might be very easily put together. We don't want simple puzzles. We likely want things that 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 we can spend some time on. Or or would it be like a tool that we could easily use? And it's like God will not fit into any of our normal human constructs. He's not man. We cannot personify him as man. He's God. So frankly, just let God be God. So we honor him as the most high. We honor him as the God that is above all, El Elyon. We honor him as the God that has no comparison, the God that has no equal. And this is part of our element of service. Now, we've already been talking about one of the elements of servants, and that's, uh, you might call the upward look. It's, it's the element of, of faith. It says, I will lift my eyes. Faith looks up. And the other element of service is, is, is an experience posture and it's specifically the element of a servant um, it says in the psalm it says look to the hand of their master like a servant does and I believe this talks about our hope that that we look ahead we know that God has a work for us yet to do and we follow on with that there's a word that's uh, mentioned of, of prevailing, uh, prevenient grace. And what that means is that is the grace that goes ahead of us, that God knows what we're going to need. And so supplies are laid ahead of us. God knows what we are going to need before we ever get there. He knows just what we need for today. And he knows just what we need for tomorrow and all of our other tomorrows. But there's one more aspect that I see in this psalm, and it's the aspect of an urgent approach. We come to God and cry out urgently. The psalmist, he says, have mercy, have mercy. Now, it's typical for a culture, for most of you in human history, to have had servants and masters. <laughs> and you pray that you get a benign and a, a wonderful master. Uh, uh, but things are no different today. Um, there, 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 there isn't any institutionalized slavery in our culture. Or is there? Are people truly free? Now, e Eugene Peterson points out two groups of people that reveal that we are not as free as we could be. First off, it's the complainers. The complainers say, well, I can't spend the money in the way that I want. I can't spend my time in the way that I want. Something's got to change. And there's another group of people that really aren't as free as they could be. And it's addicts, addicts addiction to alcohol or to drugs or obsessive work habits or even obsessive consumption. Now, every relationship that does not include God will eventually become oppressive. Every relationship that does not include God will eventually become oppressive. And that's why we have the upward look and we have the look that's ahead. And then we have the look that's around. Because when we start with God's love, when we look around and understand with our, our self-awareness of, of who we are and who God is through us, we really only learn as much as we can about who we are by knowing the one. Somebody has said that, that God is closer to our own souls than we are. So it's we get to know him as we're with him. And in Psalm 123 is an invitation to see our life of service to him in a whole new way. Oh, that we would have the better angels preside over our lives. Abraham Lincoln tries to persuade those of the union who were soon to be combatants in what we call the Civil War. And he mentioned that we might allow the mystic chords of memory to swell the chorus and, and when, when again touched by the better angels of our nature. Now the memory of the sweetness of our savor with God will lead us to always live in that better nature. We transition from 
uh, obsession on the oppressive, on the contempt of the proud, why are they treating me that way, to the freedom to live as a servant. We say, God, have mercy. We realize that from that moment that we are grateful benefactors of all of God's gracious gifts. And if we are such benefactors, then we view the rest of our lives as that which we might give back to God who has given us all good things. Romans 12, 1 says, I appeal to you, brothers, by what? By the mercies of God, by the goodness that God has had to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Now, the psalm emphasizes our actual service, our everyday ordinary lives, given according to the mercy God has given us, service. Now, our word for liturgy comes from that. Uh, the work one does on the behalf of a community, yes, spiritual worship, yes, our worship together, yes, our gatherings, which completes the arc of our continuity that we came from our master, we will return to our master and more. In fact, he points us to the obvious. Jesus makes this all very clear to his disciples in John chapter 13, verses 12 through 15, when it says he washed their feet and put on the outer garments and resumed his place. He said to them, he said to them, do you not understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and, and you're right, for I am so. If then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Mother Teresa found a diseased, maggot-ridden man brought this man to a large hospital that another missionary, Mark Buntain, ran there in Calcutta. And the man was admitted and the man uh, she, into the hospital. And she spent day after day with this man and she sat with him for hours. And at the time, at the time that the man died, the man was able to to communicate to her, thank you, thank you, he said to Mother Teresa. And she came back to the other nuns who served, and she came back with a great big smile on her face. And the others were amazed, and, and they said to her, how can you be smiling when this man died? <laughs> and she said, well, I got to minister to a suffering Jesus. For many days. I got to minister to a suffering Jesus for many days. As you've done to the least of these, you've done to me, Jesus said. So what's the focus of our service? Only that which has been done unto the Lord is what counts. Only what's done to him that we do unto him. And that's what counts. Only one life how soon it will pass, only what's done for Christ will last. So just to sum this all up, the servant then, the servant of Christ is the freest person in the world. The freest person. <laughs> Galatians 5.13 says, For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, serve one another. We must once again give up our self-centered thoughts of rejection and beg for God's mercy and love according to the phenomenal wideness of God's mercy, not according to our mere, mere, mercurial fluctuations of human affection. We go down instead of depending on his mercy. I read to you some of the final words that Eugene Peterson wrote on this psalm from his book, Long Obedience in the Same Direction. 
He said, as Psalm 123 prays the transition from oppression kicked in the teeth by complacent rich men to freedom, awaiting your mercy to a new servitude like servants alert to their master's commands. It puts us in the way of learning how to use our freedom most appropriately under the lordship of a merciful God. The consequences are all positive. I have never yet heard a servant Christian complain of the oppressiveness of his servitude. Never yet heard a servant Christian complain of the oppressiveness of his servitude. I have never yet heard a servant Christian rail against the restrictions of their service. A servant Christian is the freest person in the world. So therefore, be steadfast, immovable, always abound in the work of the Lord, for you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. From near the end of 1 Corinthians 15. Well, thanks so much for joining in here with me today. This uh, series that I've been doing, and there's a number more that are coming here, like, subscribe, share, whatever format that you are listening to here today. God bless you as you learn this life of service to be the freest person in the world.